think, you know, I would like us all just to close our eyes for a moment because as I look back and I begin to ponder the goodness of God, every, with every child that has matriculated in this house has gone on to university. Amen. 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 And that is something that is really Every child, every child, as I look at it, every child of this house has gone on to university. We've got so many people that have graduated from university. So many. And it's not me, the pastor, nor my wife, nor any of us. We are not the parents. Is God and God alone. I mean, there are children that nobody ever thought they would get to varsity. There were children that never dreamed they'd enter the university door. That got there. And they matriculated. And I looked at that and just said, God, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for that grace that you have given us to our children. Really, I mean, it's difficult. It's difficult as it is. God has carried each and every one of them through university in that way. And open up that. Not one university graduate is unemployed. Really, 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 not one. There have been two to three who graduated from university and the university employed them. I mean, this is God. This is something to shout about. Something to pray for the God. that I'm talking about. All walks. Because God is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter whether you came, come from a rich family or a poor family with God, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all. And God has been good. So I'd like us just, just a moment, just a moment, just close our eyes. I just want to thank God for it. Father, as a church, as a ministry, we want to thank you. Thank you for each and every one of our children. Thank you for opening doors where there were no doors. Thank you for creating creative opportunities for our children to further study. Thank you so much for your hand which has been stretched out towards our children. Thank you, Lord, for all that they've achieved by your grace and your grace alone. Thank you for all that you've provided for them, Father God. Thank you for, Lord God, the employment opportunities that you presented unto them. Surely thou preparest a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Surely you shall never leave us, no, for Satan. Surely you are with us. Surely you are with our children. And we want to thank you for that this morning. Father, we thank you for all the matriculants that have passed. We thank you for all those that are entering matric this year. All those that are entering high school or entering their schooling career this year. We pray that your hand of protection shall be upon them. May your glory and your might, O oh Lord, overshadow them and cover them in the name of Jesus. Let no harm and no evil, O oh Lord God, be 
full, our joy. They shall be far, O oh God, from every plague in the name of Jesus. For you, O oh Lord God, shall keep them under your wing, and in your pavilion shall you hide them. They shall be far from tyranny, O oh Lord, when it comes in the name of Jesus. They shall not be afraid, for they shall know that the Lord their God is with them. They shall, O oh Lord God, not just know it, but they shall believe it, they shall see it, they shall live it, they shall experience it, O oh God. All round success, all round favor, in Jesus' blessed name. Almighty God, we thank you now, in the name of Jesus. Father, there may have been those that maybe missed it, but let them not be dismayed nor disappointed. For Lord, O oh God, by mere fact that they are standing and looking today, O oh Lord God, is evidence enough that they can make a triumphant covenant. That Lord, O oh God, that they shall stand, and they shall grow, they shall increase, and they too shall exceed. In the name of Jesus Christ of death. Father, we give you all thanks, we give you all praise, we give you all glory and all honor, and all the worship in Jesus' wonderful name. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen.
not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Jesus is the most generous person who ever lived. He left the comforts of heaven, took on human flesh, and gave his life on the cross so that we might live in him. In response to Jesus' generosity, we are called to be generous. We are called to be generous with our money. We are called to be steward of our possessions. We are called to volunteer our time. No one argues over whether Christians should be generous. It's a hallmark of the Christian faith. Remember, tithing is not a debt we owe, but a seed we sow. Amen. Amen. Now there's a declaration I'd like to read to you all. With me. You have the power to blossom. You have purpose. You have no hold on me. I give you out of the joy of my heart that you may be a joy to this to this house. You will speak for me when I cannot speak. You are a representation of my worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a representation of my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not belong to me. You belong to the kingdom of God. Amen. What a blessing it is for us to have God for us and not against us. Hallelujah. Come and say that God is for you and not against you. Amen. Praise God. Such a blessing. Such a blessing. You know, when we study the scriptures and uh, go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you know, one never ceases to be amazed and be left in wonder and in awe of this wonderful God we have, this wonderful God we serve. Amen. I'd like for you this morning, if you could turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Amos and the third chapter. And last week, I think I shared with you about the omnipresence of God, of how near. God is to us and I trust, I really trust that you took that, you went home, meditated, built on that and that is one of the things we encourage you to do, that's why we encourage you to come to church, come with your Bible, come with a notebook and a pen so you can make notes and uh, you can during the course of the week, your Bible study, your private devotional time, to make notes and add on to what you receive. That's how we grow. Amen. That is how we grow. And I want to quickly, before I go into the Word of God, uh, I think I have greeted you, and I'd like to greet everybody that is visiting us this morning, visiting us for first time, if you're visiting us, please, would you please just raise your right hand where we can see it, so that we can just welcome you in there. Please, God, would you just raise your right hand, if you're visiting to your right hand. Praise God. Bless you, brother. Bless your family. Bless you. Welcome. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. And welcome and Sister Dolly. Is that Sister Dolly, Sister from Swaziland? That's your sister. Swazi, all the way from Swaziland. Welcome. Bless you. So good to have you visiting us. Everybody else visiting us. 
to make us really to just love the weekend. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody here, just welcome. Amen. Welcome to everybody. Welcome to your father's house. This is your father's house. And uh, we trust God. Amen. I'd like to ask Pastor Sharon, if you don't mind, if you can bless the Egyptian and our brother here, bless him with one of those, really, you know, one of those, to bless him with that, please, family. Praise God. Bless you guys. Amen. Praise God. Now, I shared with you last week along the lines of the fact that, yes, we are human beings. But we should not lose sight, or rather not forget the truth that we are actually spirit beings. Man is spirit. Man is spirit. You are actually spirit. Yes, we, we are all human beings by nature. But when you look at it in line with scripture, man is spirit. He lives in a body. He has a mind. Man is a tripart being. And how we uh, relate with God, commune with God, is through our spirit. And this morning I want to talk to you about Walking in agreement with God. It is so important. Walking in agreement with God. We've been touching on this, I think, for the past week. I've been sharing this daily with you. Agreeing with God concerning your health. Agreeing with God concerning power, the power he's made that is made available to you. Agreeing with God concerning your family, concerning um, your life concerning your finances and God when, when God called us he, his desire is not to have some of us his desire is to have all of us in other words God doesn't want some of you he wants all of you he wants your money. He wants your body. Yes, he has your heart. He, you've given your heart to him. He has them. But he wants everything about you. You understand? And you give it to him. Now that you are born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, you've been brought into covenant with God. And it is God's ideal in God's plan that we walk in agreement with him. To put it this way, let me, let me, let me just give you a definition of an agreement according to the dictionary. The dictionary describes an agreement as such. Um, an agreement is harmony or accordance in opinion or feelings. An agreement is to have harmony or accordance in opinion or feeling. In other words, we are of the same opinion. You got that? I like it. We are of the same opinion. So in other words, if I'm walking in agreement with God, to walk in agreement with God means to walk in the same opinion as God. When it comes to God, my opinion means nothing. My feelings means nothing. The crux of the whole matter is what is God's opinion over this thing? What does God feel about this thing? Come and talk to me. And I think that is where we find 
a lot of, you know, a lot of us miss it because many people tend to feel that, okay, but in my opinion, no, listen, God is not going to worry about you. I mean, he's not going to worry about your opinion. He's not going to worry about your thing. What you think. I mean, consider Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where Jesus, you know, Jesus, Jesus had a choice. Jesus could have said, Father, in my opinion, I don't think that I should do this. Father, I don't feel that, you know, that, that this is right. I don't feel that, watch it, I don't feel that this is fair. In my opinion, it's not fair. Father, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't say anything wrong. And yet now, Father, I must be punished for something that Ricardo done. I mean, Jesus had it. Jesus could have said it, but Jesus said, nevertheless, not my word, not my opinion, not my feelings, but your will, your opinion, your feeling, your will be done. See that? And we've got many people like that, especially in the body of Christ, which is sad. Yeah, but in my opinion, forget about it. Your opinion means nothing. What about God's opinion? What does God say? Don't come and tell me your opinion. What is God's opinion? Let's look at God's opinion. That's how you measure your life. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, when we can start operating that way, the Bible says when the enemy comes in as a flood, the Spirit of God will raise a standard that cannot be met. And you must understand that the enemy will do everything he can for you to lower the standard in your life so that you will live beyond, below the standard that God has actually ordained and purposed for you to live, which is, come on, talk to me. You're supposed to be an eagle, but you're there in the foul one. You're there with the pigeons in the pigeon coop, but you were called to be an eagle. You were purposed to be an eagle, to fly above the storms and the winds of life, not scratching around in the foul one. Talk to me, somebody. You see, when you can start taking out the Word of God and making the Word of God the standard, then you'll see how your standard of, the standard of your life will begin to increase. You will live above the natural. You must understand. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Is God a supernatural God? Is God a supernatural God? Amen. The Christian God is a supernatural God. You read from Genesis to Revelation, He is a supernatural God. And He's created man in His image and likeness. His purpose for man is to live a supernatural life. A life that is above the natural. A life that will even get people to wonder and say, but how is it possible that this person can do this? How is it possible? You know why? It's when you walk in agreement with God that people, listen, it's not about you as an individual. It's not about you getting famous. It's not about you getting all the praise. It's not about you getting all the glory. It's not about you getting all the honor. It's not about you getting made known amongst the people. It is about God getting the glory. It is about God getting the honor. It is about people coming to know the God that you serve. When people look at your life, there must be something in them that says, man, I want to know what is the secret that this man has. That is what the Philistines, when they look at Samson, Samson was not a man that had muscle. Samson didn't go to any virgin active. If Samson had muscles, they would never ever have questioned his strength. Samson was skin and bones. That's why the Philistines had to question and say, how come this man doesn't have muscles? He doesn't have strength. If, come on, talk to me, somebody. This man is just skin and bones. But where does his strength come from? That this man can take the gate of a city and shake it up by the hinges and carry it on his back. Come on, talk to me. On his back, up a mountain. Where does his strength
strength come from? You understand, when you're walking in agreement with God, people will begin to question what God you serve. You see, the early church walked in power. Read the book of Acts. The early church walked in power. Man, the apostle Paul was sitting down, preaching the gospel around the fire, and a serpent, a deadly serpent, bit him. It bit him. And Samson just looked at it, took the serpent, shook it off into the fire, and carried on talking about his God. And the people, when the people looked at that, the people were amazed because those people that lived there, they understood that if that serpent were to bite you, it was your death sentence. They had to get F Bob and 21st century and all these people ready to carry your corpse because you were surely going to die. But when the serpent had come and talked to me, when it bit, when it bit the apostle Paul, Paul took it, he shook it off into the fire and carried on talking about the works of God. That the people began to question, what manner of man is this? What God does this man serve? That even the most deadliest snake that's found in our island has put him and nothing has come of him. It's because the God that Paul walked with, the God that Paul was in agreement with, was the God that said no weapon that was formed against you shall prosper. He's the God who said that every tongue that rises up in condemnation against you, you shall rise up and you shall condemn. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He's the God who said that if you drink any poisonous drink, it shall by no means harm you. Are you hearing me, somebody? That is the God that saw had. Come and talk to me. He's the God that when you get to the sea and there's no way across the sea that you can take your garment and you can strike the waters and the waters will part. He calls the other prophets to ask and say, surely the same spirit that was upon Elijah is the same spirit that's upon Elisha. It's time that the world began to see. The world has heard a lot about Jesus, but we're living in a day and age, brothers and sisters in Christ, according to the word of God. In the past, in the book of Joel, chapter number two, the God, God said in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. These are those days. We're living in a day and an age when people look at the church and they look at them and say, my goodness, the same spirit that was upon Jesus that I read about in the scripture is the same spirit that's upon that brother. When you're walking in agreement with God, it means what God has said. Despite what I see, despite what I hear, despite what I feel, I will not be moved. Because I have a God who will speak for me. I have a God who will answer for me. You could, you could probably start a business that somebody has been dreaming for thousands of years. It's been probably been in, in a family for many years. And you know that they've been specialists and you've never done this thing before. But you take that step of faith. Though. I'm talking to somebody this morning. You take that step of faith. Though. Enough with sitting in your comfort zone and feeling sorry for yourself and blaming circumstances, and blaming the government, and blaming your family, blaming your parents, blaming everybody under the sun except yourself. You gotta get to a place where you say enough is enough. I'm done with sitting in this boat. I'm gonna agree with God. God said, come and talk to me, talk to me, somebody. He said to me, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. How do you resist the devil? Jesus showed us by hitting him with the word. You tell him it is written. It is written. 
it is written, 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 it is written. Then you get to the point where you say, enough is enough. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. I'm moving forward. You're not going to keep me back from what God has called me to do. You're not going to keep me back from the life that God has ordained for me. Enough with the lies. Enough with telling me that, oh, you know, our whole family has this thing. No, I don't belong to that, to that thing. You understand? I'm of another genetic line. I have the genes of Christ. I have the genes of Christ. The genes have changed. I have his DNA. An agreement is a negotiated. Watch here. It's a negotiated and typically legal binding agreement between parties as to a course of action. In order for an agreement to come into effect, an agreement begins with an offer. One party makes an offer to another. And then the one that is hearing the offer, the one to whom the offer is being made to, assesses the offer and if that person accepts the offer there's an offer and then there's an acceptance of the offer once that offer has been accepted the agreement is in effect and in force If you go to a, to a court, that, that is what they will do. establish. They first try to establish. Was there an offer? Yes. Was there acceptance? Yes. Therefore, there was an agreement. It's legally binding. God gave us an offer, His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the offer. He gives us the offer, Jesus Christ. What is the offer? In receiving Christ, I receive eternal life. In receiving Christ, I receive eternal life. Life as God has life. Life the way God designed life to be for me. That's God's offer. And when I accept it, I accept it when I believe it. The minute I believe it, I believe it and I confess it, I am not saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in all of thy heart, that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Offer and acceptance. Now, God legally is your father, is your judge, is your lawyer, is your advocate, is your provider. He's your healer. He's your deliverer. He's your employer. He's your everything. And you know what? Everything that has been made available to you and I is in this way. It's in the spirit. That if you knew 
doing what was in his will. You wouldn't be running to and fro when children were tossed about with every wind of doctrine. But you know the truth, and the truth would set you free. Just over a month ago, just over a month ago, <clears throat> while sleeping, I remember it was a Sunday morning, <clears throat> a Sunday morning at about quarter to three in the morning. We heard a sound. It sounded like a gunshot, even like a bomb. It sounded like a bomb. And then we started hearing this crackling thing that keep on breaking, breaking. Every second that goes, this thing is breaking. When we investigated, we found that the tree behind our house had collapsed because of all the, the water. Remember when it rained excessively towards the end of January? And we had someone last year give us a price on getting rid of that tree. And we said, okay, it's nice to know so that we can work towards saving them. And lo and behold, this thing happened without us saving for it. <clears throat> and at 3 a.m., I went outside, I looked at the tree, I said to Pastor Sharon, I think this thing has just damaged the wall at the back of the house, and it's damaged the neighbor's wall too. If it falls any further, it's, it's falling on my neighbor's house, and the part that's still up, it's falling on my bedroom and Joshua's bedroom. So from 3 o'clock in the morning, Pastor Sharon, God, and I, and I don't want to be speaking to God. Say, Lord, where are we going to get this money from? At about half past four, God told me, you dummy. You dummy. You are exactly as everybody else. I've given you everything. I've provided everything for you that you have available, but you're not using it. I thought, I said, Lord, where am I getting that money from? God said, go to the documents of the house. So we went, we took all the documents of the house out, and we started reading. Lo and behold, we find there's insurance against this type of thing. Oh, and when the tree fell again, the price he gave us wasn't the price he gave us before to remove the tree. It was more than that. But God covered. What am I trying to get across? God has given us so much in his word. But because we don't familiarize ourselves with his word, as I was also stupid to familiarize myself with the entire benefits I had, I had almost two hours of worry for nothing. And sometimes we can live our lives in a lifetime of worry when God has given us a stress-free life by His word. Come and talk to me, somebody. You may say, I 
have a pastor, but it's insurance. I don't care which way it happens, God answers. I know of a place where the building was about to be repossessed. And the people were standing in a circle praying. They were praying, having a prayer meeting. That's why I don't think they had prayer meetings. They were praying. And they were standing in agreement praying for this church. True story. And then, whilst praying, when they said Amen, it was found that not far away, there was a robbery that took place. And these robbers hid the money in a bag somewhere. And they got caught by the police. And they were arrested to conserve their time. And this dog found this bag, brought the bag to the center of these people that were praying, left the bag there and stood and waited for them to say amen. When they said amen and they opened the bag, there was the money there, the exact amount they needed for the church. If God Man. God, God will make a, listen, don't get into it. Pastor is illegal, illegal. I'm not going to get the money was there, just provided. Me. <laughs> when the ravens were feeding the prophet, where did the food come from? I'm not worried where it came from, but it came. It was there. When Israel needed manna, I'm not worried where it came from, it was there. That's what I'm trying to get across. Is that God will look after you. The book of Psalms, chapter 66, verse 5, in the message translation says, Take a good look at God's wonders. They'll take your breath away. The way God works. You know, that's why this. This is the God we serve. When he does something, you lost for words. You can't even say anything. You can just say, ah. You can just say, the word, words fail you. You left in awe. And that's my word of encouragement to you this morning. In the book of Amos, I told you, Amos 3 verse 3, God speaking to the prophet Amos, to the nation of Israel, God was actually rebuking Israel because there was no other nation or family known to God except Israel. No one else. Hallelujah. Amos 3 verse 1, God says, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. You only have I known. And then he goes on and he says, Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. You see that? Then it goes to verse 3. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? You see that? If you walk in agreement, there's no punishment for you. There's no sorrow or hardship for you. You've got to just walk in agreement. In spite of what's happening around you, in spite of who agrees with you or not, you agree with God, period. In spite of the opinion of men, in spite of the opinion of people, come on, you must get to a point where you become like Job. You say, though he slay me, I will serve him. Where you get to the point and say, even if the whole world disagrees with me, but I agree with God, 
I'd rather be standing alone, agreeing with God, than standing with the whole world, disagreeing with God. You have to, come on, you must make up your mind. Make up your mind. Make a quality decision that you will agree with God. God says you blessed, you blessed. Amen. Don't let your neighbor that comes across the road and say, Ooh, Marky, hey, I saw your neighbor next door. One to tell a man, he they were bathing, they took the water, threw it into you. I think yeah, they've done something for you. Say, hey, whom the Lord has blessed, he has blessed. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. The enemy may come one way, he scatters on seven ways. Whatever they come and talk to you. Don't be worried about what people say that people are doing to you. No. Hey, God has done something greater. God has saved me. God has redeemed me. He's given me righteousness. His righteousness. Not my righteousness. His righteousness. I'm his child. I'm not going to worry about them. They slept me on this cheek. I'll say, man, you slept like a baby. Try this one now. Try another. I will not repay evil with evil. Rather, I will do it with good. Repay evil with good. Someone curses you, bless them. It's wisdom. Why do you think Jesus said to his disciples, he says when you go into a house and there's a man of peace, say peace be upon this home. If there's a man of peace, your peace will, will rest there. If there's no man of peace, your peace will return back to you. Boomerangs. What you send out, you're going to get back. They cursing, you cursing, guess what? You're getting a curse back. If that person that cursed decides to repent, turn their heart. Now what happens? That person's blessed. What did you do? You cursed. So you're getting the curse to send double for you. Come on, talk to me. You must understand your spirit being. That's why you going to spend time with the scriptures. Spend time with God. So God can enlighten your understanding. So you can begin to think like he thinks. He's called you to bless, not to curse. Oh, you've gone too quiet. You've gone too quiet. When you agree with God, you are actually walking in obedience. When you agree with God, you are walking in obedience. It's when you disagree that you are disagreeing. Look at Saul. Do you remember King Saul? God told him, destroy everything. Young king, don't leave anything. Others utterly destroyed. What did Saul do? Ah, I think this one looks nice. It will look nice there. Woo, this one's also nice. So he kept all the nice, killed all the bad. And then thought, oh, praise God, God gave us the victory. When the prophet came and the man of God came, Samuel came, he said, what is this that you have done? What is this that you have done? He says, because you have done this thing, this day, your kingdom has been stripped away from you. And the Lord has sought a man after his own heart. You see, when you agree with God, you are obedient to God, and you are after His heart, because His heart is what matters to you. What matters is what God's heart matters. That should be your understanding. That should be your foundation. That should be the blueprint of your life. Is what makes God's heart rejoice. Not mine, but what makes his heart be just? Come and talk to me, Sam. Hallelujah. That same Psalm 66, verse 5, the New Living Translation says, Come and see what our God has done, what awesome miracles he performs for people. God has a miracle in store for you. It doesn't matter what your eyes may be seeing. 
It doesn't matter what your ears may be hearing. It doesn't matter what you may be feeling as an individual, psychologically. Understand that God is spirit, and you are spirit, and God is working on it, and God has you covered. I say God has you covered. You rejoice in the courts of the Lord your God. What happened? Let me ask you. All right, let me, let me, let me try and illustrate something for you in closing. If somebody violates your human rights, what do you do? You answer. Somebody violates your human rights. Seems like you don't, I don't know. You are sleeping at home at night. They've got municipal bylaws. You are sleeping at night. At 12.45 in the evening, somebody is playing the music blaring loud. What do you do? You wake up and say, Woo, they played my song. <laughs> what do you do? You pick up the phone and you phone the police. Listen, they disturb. What, what are they disturbing? Your peace. They disturb your peace. Somebody snatches your handbag. What have they done? They've stolen from you. They've robbed you. They've infringed your rights. What do you do? You open a case. Not so. And then you go to court. Not so. And then the court will rule in terms of what? The law of the country. Because that person has broken the law. <laughs> When you're a child of God, you understand, you operate not by the natural laws of the world, but there's a law that is a higher law. Come and talk to me. When the enemy does something to you, you go to the court, the court of courts, the Supreme Court. Come and talk to me. You go to the Supreme Court. You bring your case before the Lord. And then the Lord, Lord, it's your word. It's your word. Someone has stolen from you. Yeah, in the natural court, they'll say, okay, if the person can't pay you, then they're going to serve so long, or if they did manage to get the stuff, you'll get your broken stuff back, the person will serve his time. But you know what? In this word it says, when a person steals from you, he's going to repay you seven times more. I'm in the wrong place. This book says seven times more. So when I take my I, I, I take my case to God, that the enemy has to repay me seven times. Seven times. Seven times. Seven times. A man of God by the name of Lester Sumral. I'm closing with this. Lester Sumral. I don't know if any of you know him. He was ministering. He went to minister in a particular place. And whilst he was ministering there, God was doing great and mighty things through Lester Sumba. So much so that, you know, they gave him an opportunity. He was looking for a large open place where he could preach. And, they, and everywhere he went, they would say, no, 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 no. Lester Sumba. Then the mayor of that place came to Lester Sumba. And he said to Lester Sumba, if you can do us this one thing, you can have your crusade, I'll give you the city hall if it's not big enough, I'll give you the large open place for as long as you want. Just do me this one favor. In our prison, there's somebody there that's demon possessed. If you can go and help us with their problem, I'll solve your problem. 
Let's assume Ra said no problem. So let's assume Ra went. Problem solved. Came back to his hotel room that night whilst Lester Sumra was asleep on his bed. Next thing, the window blew open, the curtains blew, his bed started shaking. So much so the headboard of the bed that was against the wall was shaking until he came to the center of the room. And Lester Sumra recognized it's the same two demons he cast out of that demon possessed. And Mr. Sumra chased him. He said, in the name of Jesus, get out of my room. Ha <laughs> ha. They left. Guess what happened? Mr. Sumra looked around. They left. He looked around. He said, man, my bed is not where it was. He shouts. Hey, wait, hold on, one minute, come back, come back, come back. Come back. Say, listen, you fix my bed, put it back where it was, and you get out of here. You know what happened? The same demons fixed the bed and moved. The enemy comes and runs havoc in our lives. We chase him, but you forget to tell him, listen, you fix up your mess, and you get out in the name of Jesus. Come and talk to me, somebody. God has given me peace, perfect peace. His word says, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon you. Come on. So if the enemy comes to disturb your peace, you send him packing. But if he messed up anything, listen, you're going to fix what you messed up, and you're going to get up, because I have a message in me. It's called the message. Of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'm not ashamed of it because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel that we received is a gospel of power. It's a gospel of power. We need to tell our children that we see the gospel of power. We have a gospel of power in your workplace. I don't care what's happening in your workplace. You have a gospel of power. I don't care what's happening in your home. You have a gospel of power. I don't care what's happening in your body. You have a gospel of power. Paul says, we have this treasure in earth and vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I don't care what's happening around a gospel of power. That's why he even warns the church and he says beware of those who have a form of godliness. It sounds right. It seems right. It looks right. But they deny the power of it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we received a gospel of power. It's time it is time we took Jesus' example and we bent down and you drew a line in your life. You said enough is enough. No more. Satan, you stay on that side. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Get to a time when you've got to say, you've got to make up your mind. I can't do it for you. My job as a pastor, and the job of any other pastor, is to get you connected. But it's your job to stay connected. You are the one that has to say, enough is enough. I will not tolerate this thing anymore. I've had enough of it. Come on, talk to me. Begin to walk in agreement with God. Walking in agreement means 
I'm walking in partnership. And when I'm in partnership, it means I have one who has my back. It means you touch me, you touch him. If the enemy wants to touch you, if the enemy wants to touch you, if the enemy wants to harm you, if the enemy wants to destroy you, you'll never get it right. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Of Him are you in Christ. Your life is hid in Christ. So if the enemy wants to get to you, if he wants to get to your marriage, if he wants to get to your family, it's got to come through the Father, through the Son, and through the Holy Ghost. But God will be there. You will be there. That's why Jesus said, Go, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The thing is, what has the church been taught? What are we teaching? to observe all that I have commanded. Before Jesus ascended, he was teaching his disciples about this new life. A higher life. Life of God. The ability in humanity. Where I go, he goes. Where I am, he is. God. 
Because with Israel, he's the same God who's with you today. If you're a business person, let him manage your business. Let him take over. Let him bring the customers. Let him, let him, before you do any decision, before you do anything, give it to God first. Maybe even before you go shopping. You know, you get these folks, they come and say, Ooh, I bought so little, but look how much. I bet you, if you ask that person, did you pray before you shop? You tell you no. Maybe pray. Say, Lord, this is what I have. You multiply it for the world. Oh, Jesus. You know you have rights as a child of God. You have rights. You go. He says, remind me of my word. I go, Lord, you wrote it. You wrote it. This is your word. You said, try me, test me. Now, Lord, I'm testing you. I did what you asked me to do. Now I'm testing you. You did it for the widow. You can do it for me. You did it in the wilderness, the fish, the loaves. You did it there. You bring it for me. Lord, that, listen, that's how you walk in agreement with God. That's how you put this word to work. You must, this word, unless you bring this word to the forefront, it will, you will not experience the reality of it. This is a living word, brothers and sisters. This is not a word that you open up when you can't sleep in the middle of the night and you use as a story book to close, to cause you to close your eyes. This is not a history book. This is a book of life. You can look for the countless of experiences that you and I go through that you can look for in the Word and you can bring this to the forefront and you can meditate on this and you can say, God, you did it then. God, you are not a man that you should lie. God, you never change. God, heaven and earth may pass away. What you were doing here for this widow, you're doing it for me, and I'm trusting you, Lord. It could be a sickness. The doctor could have diagnosed you with something. It could be a sickness. Hezekiah, you remember what happened with Hezekiah? You remember? The doctor diagnosed me a few months ago. I showed you, I brought the things to you. With chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The terminal disease. There's no cure for it. I told you, I only need you to trust me and have faith with me. I took those things, put them here. You remember? I stood on it. And we prayed over it. We spoke the word of God over it. And I went home and together with Pastor Sharon and my children. We said, Lord, you did it for Hezekiah. You lengthened his number of days. Lord, you're going to do it for me. Guess what? I went, they did test after test after test. No sign of COPD. Nothing. Nothing. Because I said, the voice that I have, the breath that I have in these lungs, it's not mine, it is God's. And my last breath that I take with, this, with these lungs will be the breath that God has given. Every day I wake up with His. Knees. The last breath that I take, it will be His. I give Him everything of it. And I was healed, completely healed. Completely healed. I did three tests at work. They did lung function tests. All those tests that they did, even the x-rays, no sign of COPD, nothing whatsoever. <laughs> That's the God we say. Amen. Before we close, I kind of went a little bit over time, I apologize. But I feel some people needed to hear what I needed to share. Because we serve an amazing God. I would like to invite Sister Diane. First cancer patient. Yes.
survivor and cancer survivor. And I've had a massive heart attack and I've got four stents. And last March, I just took him. And I didn't know what was going on in me. The doctors, they said it was ulcer, ulcers, treating me for ulcer. Finally, my daughter said, no, let's get to the hospital. When I reached the hospital and the doctors saw me, they told me, you are jaundice. So they done all the tests and they thought it was my liver, but all my organs was 100% fine. And they didn't know what triggered this jaundice. At that time, the virus was out and there were no hospitals that were being scanned. But my daughter managed to get to the private hospital and make arrangements and pay for it for them to do a scan. And when they did the scan, they told me, you've got a mess growing over your pancreas and it's, it's a 50-50 chance because you was you are a cancer survivor. I said, thank God. Okay. So we got home, then when I was going to Matadeni Hospital, I've taken the scan and I've been there. The doctor checked it and then he referred me to Grace. He said, you have to be admitted and they have to see what surgery they can do. I went to Grace. And they've done numerous tests and they found the same thing. And then finally they sent me to Albert Tatuli and they told me no, I must go for a skull and a biopsy to see what it is. When I got there, the doctors put the camera down and they said no, we don't see no mess, we can see stones. Sent me back with the report came back to Grace and then they said no, they are looking at it in a different version. They said no, we're going to do an MRI for you. And when they did that, they could still see that my life is in danger. Then they said no, the only thing is we cannot do anything for you. We need to speak to your entire family because you don't look good. I said the doctor, I am strong and I'm a believer. Amen. Yes. I'm a believer and, and I know. He said, yes, you are looking very healthy and you are a, got a positive mind. I said, yes, I have a positive mind that there's nothing wrong with me. So finally he said, but all the scans and the report and the MRI is showing us what's going on inside me. Then they made arrangements, appointment for my whole family to be there and then they said, there's nothing we can do for your mom. We just have to take it one day at a time. Because of her previous conditions and her heart is, she's got stents, it's not safe. But the operation will be six hours and we have to separate all our organs to get there to the pancreas and we don't think she will survive, she will not make it. She will not wake up again. So my children said, I'm sure there is some other way that you can do something for my mom. I said, okay, take her home, it's Christmas, enjoy, have the best of it with her. Let all the families be with her. And on the 25th of January, come back because the hospitals are closing, most of the doctors are going on leave. You come back on the 25th and we will have the heart specialist to look at you to see how strong your heart is and we have the anesthetic guy to look at you to see how much of anesthetic your body can take and then we'll take it on, from there on we'll take it. If everything is good on the 29th, we will try to do something. So I was in the hospital just reading my Bible and I never stopped praying from the time that I said, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And I said, God, you are my healer. God, you are my healer. You are the healer. You're going 
going to eat me like what? And that Thursday, the doctor saw me, he said, your heart is under pressure, everything is normal. And the anesthetic guy said, now I will know what to do. I want to be anesthetic to give you. So Thursday, they prepared me. And all, they put all the uh, pipes for me and everything for the anesthetic. The doctors put all the papers. They asked me to give authorization for this to go to theater on Friday. They said they're just waiting for the consultant and all the specialists. There will be about 10 doctors coming to see me with, their, uh, with the report and I was just egg on and they just prepared me for theater. So fine. When the consultants and all the doctors came and I was still sitting there on my bed and I'm just reading. And then the consultant told me, Mrs. Naidu, we just come out from a meeting about your case. I'm sending you all. I said, oh, yes, doctor. Am I going home? I'm so happy, doctor, to get home after one year of all this, what I've been going through. And I said, aren't I going to theater tomorrow? He said, no. I don't know which God you serve. Yeah. Yes! Hallelujah! You are our miracle lady. If we look through all the tests we read down before we take you to the theater, there's no trace of anything in you. You are cleared. I said, Amen. I was an honor and an honor. I said, Doctor, you called my entire family here and you discussed my health. And he said that I will not make it. And praise God, I'm here today and I've made it. Yes. Yes. Lord, we bleed your blood upon each and every one. 
divine protection over them, that your favor surround them, that they be blessed, O oh God, in their going out, and blessed in their coming in. May they truly know the blessing of the Lord, which make it rich, and you have your soul. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each and every one, both now and forevermore. In Jesus has given us the name, and the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Amen.